Okay. <laughs> We're going to take a very deep dive tonight with uh, this movie. This is a very metaphysical movie. It's an answer to the prayer of the heart. When you have a calling in your heart and you want to move more towards the light and be more disidentified from the body and disidentified from the personality self. And to most human beings that's not even something they consider because they're quite sure that they are who they are. And most people are quite sure that there may be something more but they have no idea what that something is. And there has to be steps that lead you experiences you have that start to show you without a shadow of a doubt that you are more than you think yourself to be. So this movie is, is a tremendous teaching device for beginning to come into contact with consciousness. Because for many people consciousness is a word that they hear used a lot. And there's a lot of definitions of consciousness. Um, there, it's used in many different ways, just like the word soul is used in many different spiritualities, in many different ways, in many different meanings to people. Consciousness is sometimes seen to be uh, very all expansive and all powerful, but Jesus is telling us that consciousness is the domain of the ego. So when we speak of a split mind, we're speaking of consciousness. And consciousness is the receptive mechanism of the mind that's receiving messages from above the right mind and the Holy Spirit and below the wrong mind and the ego. And Consciousness can inspire action, so it seems in this world as if there's a brain inside a body and that individual personality self is capable of making decisions. It's not really so. Even scientists now are being discovered that, that everything is set and the, the script is written and it's it's entirely determined and prearranged, and the choice that we have, we have to go much further back into the mind, we have to go into consciousness, because we are choosing between the right mind and the wrong mind. We are choosing between listening to higher guidance and the lower mind every moment of every day. But we're not aware of those decisions. So the decisions are being made much deeper in mind, in consciousness, than, than our, our awareness, our everyday awareness is, is aware of, in the sense that when, when people get sick, usually they believe they catch, they catch the sickness from something in form, from a virus, or <coughs> from some kind of exposure to something, or exposure to radiation, or exposure to something, and they don't realize that it's a decision that's being made, but it's, it's not a conscious decision. And, and the workbook Jesus says there's a, there's a quick forgetting. You first decide what you're going to do, and then you forget what you decided, and then it's part of the story. Oh, I, caught, I caught a flu bug, or I was exposed to this, and there's a story that's made up to explain the symptoms. But that story is a make-believe story that really is just totally fictitious and it's a decision in the mind, but it's, the mind is just not aware of it, making these decisions. I said before, who in, who in their right mind would choose to be sick? No one in their right mind would choose to be sick, but many decisions are wrong-minded decisions and the mind is simply not aware that it's making them. So every time you, you draw something to you that doesn't feel good or you interpret it's not good, it's coming from a wrong-minded uh, decision. All upset is obviously a wrong-minded decision, regardless of 
the intensity of the emotion or the type of the emotion or the degree of the emotion or the direction of the emotion. This movie is going to center on a main character, Captain Coulter Stevens, and it's going to be an assignment that he's going to have, but as we go deeper into the movie, there's going to be a lot of mysteries. Uh, things are not going to seem as what they are for him, and for a good part of the movie, you could say the main character is just trying to get a clue about what is happening. He is very, very confused and disoriented about what is happening, and he's trying to piece it together. But this is so symbolic of the spiritual journey, because as you go much deeper, things just start to fall away from your experience, and it just keeps continuing. Things keep falling away, falling away. I just had another conversation today during the break, and it was more falling away, falling away. And, and it's, it's like a deconstructing process. It's like a dismantling of the self-concept. And in this case of this movie, uh, we're going to have little bits and pieces, so I'm going to have commentary along the way to give some insights on the deconstruction that's going on. Starting off with the movie, um, even the basic perception of, of a man uh, on a train with a woman uh, having a conversation, and they're on a, on a train to Chicago, and it looks like that is like a, a scene of the movie, but we're going to realize that that's just a perception, and that even that basic conversation, the man who is speaking to the woman isn't, he has a different appearance. He seems to be in a different body than he's used to being in. Just imagine for yourself, even for a day, if you had an experience, that you were speaking to people and they were talking to you as if you were someone other than your personality self. How, how jolting that would be. Uh, in this case, the woman's going to get this impression, like it's a real spontaneous, fresh conversation, and she's used to talking to this man, but she has experienced him as completely different, and now during this conversation she's going to begin having a kind of a connection and a, and a heart opening that she doesn't understand, but she's kind of surprised because uh, it, Captain Colter Stevens will come into play more and more in the focus, but in, originally I think she's calling the man Sean. So imagine if you were proceeding a conversation with someone and they started calling you by another name, and they were seeing you as a different person. That would be a good start in disidentifying from the body. <laughs> if people were talking to you as if you were someone else. And that's what's going to happen in this movie. And that's just the, the beginning of the movie. This one's going way, way, way down the rabbit hole, with, and the commentary will show you the steps along the way. So, in one sense, if you've said, well, I would love to disidentify from the body, I would love to get more focused on the present moment than time, uh, but I have no idea how that's going to happen. Well, this movie is part of how it's going to happen, because you're going to do it vicariously through the main character of this movie. You will be able to identify with him very closely, and then you will start to realize that uh, when he doesn't understand what's happening, as you're following along the movie, that will raise the question, what has happened? <laughs> and, and Jesus is helping us to start to realize that what we perceive as our everyday normal perception of the world, of us as a personality self in a world of external people and external places and things, isn't really the way things are. And the deeper we go, there's a very, very, very different perception of the world that's going to be shown to us. And it's very expansive, and it's very wondrous and miraculous. And this movie really goes there. 
This is one of the few movies too where, you know, Jesus said, into eternity, we're all as one. There crept a tiny mad idea in which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. This has got to be one of the best kind of closing scenes where you actually go through a journey and come into an experience of closer to the unified field where there's nothing but joy and laughter. And it comes through in a way that's very surprising uh, to a remember to laugh scene at the very end. You know, it's, it's, you can feel the expansiveness at the end of the movie because it's, it's going to take us all the way to that expansive state of mind where it's like truly we are all in this together. We're all in the mind together. We're all one self. So, let's roll it and so I'll get the commentary as we go in because it's Put your Sherlock Holmes hats on today, because we're going diving into consciousness. So, Captain Colter Stevens, he's kind of in a situation that's closer to where Jesus wants us to be. Those workbook lessons, I do not, nothing I see means anything, I do not know what anything is for. Uh, he's, he's inserted into a station to a, like a, a, a state of mind and, a, and a, a situation, we'll call it a dream scenario, that you could see he was hearing some things that seemed to have to do with the military in his mind, but then when he comes into awareness, his eyes open, you can see the sh look of shock and surprise on his face. It's like, what is this? And then, if that wasn't enough of a shock, then he's, he hears a snap from a, a, a pop can, he, there's a spill of a drink on his shoe, then the guy's coming asking for his ticket, and the woman across from him is talking to him like she knows who he is, and, and he's, when he's asked for a ticket, he's asked for something, and he, he's, he's very, very disorienting because he just does not understand the perception. It's a little snapshot of Jesus saying, this is, this is what I want you to come into. I want you to come away from thinking you know who you are in time and space, where you are, what you're doing, with such a strong personal identification with, with the body and a strong orientation, that you seem to have a memory of how you got where the, where you, the body seems to be now and where the body's going next. There's a very strong personal orientation, and that is the ego's projection of, of a character that it has made up to take the place of your Christ reality, of the light. So the more anchored in and the more identified you are with the character, with everything around the character, which we've all taken on to be survival, but we better know who we are, we better have our identity cards with us, at all time, we better have our little supercomputer, don't leave home without it. Uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of things that we believe in that are so tied into survival, and Jesus is saying, yeah, it's all part of a body, personality, identity, survival game. You're playing a game that you have to unwind from. And there will be a series of steps that will allow you to unwind from that identification. And they will be scary a little bit, because the ego has convinced you that you are what you're not. And now as you start coming back more into consciousness, it's going to be a little scary every time, because it's almost like something's breaking down, something's falling apart, something's not, something is amiss. You know, he's like, what is going on? And then she calls him Sean, he's like, listen, lady, <laughs> this is who I am, I'm Captain Coulter Stevens, uh, I, I'm in the army, I fly a helicopter in Afghanistan, and she's just like smiling at him like, what is up with you today, Sean? So he seems to be slipped into an entire different person, and, and that's going to be part of the device that this movie uses to free us from thinking we are who we are. Because we, 
we have a lot of insecurity tied into this uh, personality identity. And we need it rinsed, we need it washed really thoroughly from our mind in order to feel the vastness of who we are. Okay, here we go. We'll f it, it just gets more interesting as it moves along. Starts off with a train going to Chicago and then it's like, whoa. <laughs> I think our friend Maria had a roller. <laughs> this is a little more extreme. So, <laughs> so he's just on the train for minutes. He looks in the mirror. It's some guy he doesn't know. He looks in the wallet. It says Sean Fentress. He doesn't know who the woman is. He, he said, what is, what is that? And the guy says, Chicago. You know, he has totally been thrown into a scene that he has no identification with whatsoever. And then it ends, the scene ends with the plane, or the train blowing up, completely blowing up. So, that's a scenario, and now we're going to see that that scenario is part of an assignment, a mind assignment. You know, like when we watch movies like Groundhog Day, and Phil, the weatherman, has to relive the same day over and over. And we, it's very insightful with these time loop movies, because we can notice all these nuances in time loop movies that we don't usually notice in other movies. Well, this is a, a movie where we're going to see the same scene we just saw, the same scenario on the train, the same scene played over and over. It's part of some kind of mind assignment that he doesn't understand, and the viewers, we don't understand either at this point. And it's for some kind of a purpose there is going to be, it's a, like an experiment using his consciousness for a particular outcome, but always Jesus has a different purpose for every assignment that we believe. We may believe we have relationship assignments and we may say, this is like what I think the purpose is of our relationship assignment. In most cases we're wrong. Whatever we've thrown in, into there to try to explain it to ourselves, we're something much more than what we've ever conceived of. And in this movie, there's a purpose for the assignments that actually we'll find as it goes along. It's just a much, Jesus has a bigger purpose than any assignment we could possibly imagine. So here we go. We've just seen the first scenario, train scenario. <laughs> so, Clearly, after the first eight minutes, and then what he went through with the, with Goodwin and a, and a man coming on the screen and everything, he's now oriented from completely disoriented about it to now he is seeing the train as a simulation. And he's saying, look at the detail. That's one of the first steps that Jesus wants us to do, is look around you. <laughs> it looks so real. He would, Jesus would love it if we would just start to see the world, just begin to see the world as a simulation, because we're not going to be able to advance too far in this curriculum if we don't. If we are actually seeing it as real people, and real things, and real environments, that's going to be a problem. Because that's just playing right into the ego's hands of, of having you believe you're something you're not. And believing you're a character, that you are the character. And you not, not only are the character, but you know about the character, you know the history and the ambitions of the character, and you know the environment that you're in. That's the familiarity that I was talking about earlier, when, when the mind becomes attached to the familiarity, then it becomes addicted to the familiarity, and then to feel stuck. You, you pretty much have identified the main character as you. You've got all these issues which you can write out and you know what the issues are. When somebody talks to you and say, what's going on with your life? Well, you want to sit down, you have a few hours, a few weeks, I'll tell you about myself, I'll tell you what's going on in great detail, all the issues that are going on. And it's all a simulation. It's all just I have given everything, I see all the meaning. So, now it seems to be some kind of a military assignment, and he's been told, go back, um, 
find the bomb and find the bomber. So he now is seeing that he's Captain Coulter Stevens, he's got some kind of military assignment and he's, he's hurled back into a simulation, but he's just marveling when he opens his eyes in the train again about the, the detail of the simulation. But immediately you can see he, he says to her across from him, you're the doer, oh this is, you're the distraction. Like, he's using his military training like, oh I've got something very important I'm supposed to find out. And you're, you're the distraction. And, and yet, she's very lighthearted with him because it, it can seem that we're given specific instructions for particular scenes in our life or particular scenarios, but obviously there's some greater purpose that's much bigger than any assignment that we could perceive. It's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's like forgiveness. It's the forgiveness of the whole world. And somehow we've got to be led back into that experience of seeing the world as like a lucid dream. Uh, when we are not seeing it as a lucid dream. So here we go. He's, He's, he's on his mission now, he's been told, find the bomb and find the bomber. Mm -hmm. So he's got a, a purpose, a military purpose, and meanwhile, you notice when they said, where's your ticket? He was able to scoop the ticket out. You see, he's, he's flowing with it, you know? He's, he's like, okay, I'm in it now, I'm in it, I'm, I'm with the game. I'm playing the game now, I'm playing the game. And he's adapted a little bit. So, what the movie is doing is it's, little by little kind of showing us that the perceived world that we seem to live in, that seems so real, is a simulation. It's just a simulation of images. Even most scientists on the planet now, if you really ask them what is actually going on, many, many, many scientists now believe that, that what we call daily life, what we call this world, is a simulation. Elon Musk is one of them, along with many others. They don't know who is running the simulation, they don't know how the simulation got started, they really don't know anything more, but their hunch is that we're watching some kind of simulation where things just keep repeating. And we know how it is in daily life. We see enough repetitions, and there's these slight changes and events that happen, but it seems very much like a simulation, and we could say it seems very, very real, which a simulation is intended to be. There's so many movies that, that show uh, The Matrix, you know, came out, what, 1999, The Matrix was showing the world as a simulation. And, and everybody watched it and was like, what? You know, that was a really a strong introduction of the simulation idea, but it, it came before that. So, first thing is that this movie is kind of showing that there's a simulation, and he's given a purpose for the simulation. You know, find the bomb, then find the bomber. And now, Goodwin's saying, you know, civilian lives are at stake, and it seems to be part of some kind of a bomb threat in Chicago that could uh, kill many, many people, and he's being used in a military exercise to try to find and perhaps prevent um, a, a lot of murders. So he's now got some kind of a, a military context for the assignment of what he's supposed to be doing. And he's talking to Goodwin, but he's still, he's questioning when he's not in, in the simulation, he seems to be in some kind of a containment, and there's some kind of fluid coming down, and he seemed to be strapped in, and he's questioning the straps and what the liquid is on the wall, and, and, and at first he was questioning the simulation, but now he's been given a little bit of an orientation, so he's not just there all bewildered, he's trying to use the simulation for, the, for a, a military purpose, or for a saving human lives purpose. Now she said, go, go in and start to get to, to know the passengers, but basically telling him, you know, there's, there's 52 
cell phone calls, and one of those cell phone calls is the bomber that's going to detonate. So she's giving him more clues to find the bomber. And imagine that, imagine that this world is a simulation and, and Jesus is just calling you to come back in your mind to start to ask a question with regard to everything that you perceive. And what is that question? It is, what is it for? He says that's the one question you could safely ask with every scenario that you see in the simulation. What is it for? What is the purpose? That's different than what we're used to. We're used to thinking it's real, we're a human being, we're trying to survive, make a better life, achieve some goals, achieve some ambitions, and make a life for ourselves. You know, we've got goals for the simulation, but Jesus is trying to teach us, no, you don't really know what's going on, and you've got a screen of images there, and you're so identified with the character, and with the characters, and with all these different scenarios, dream scenarios you've set up, and, and there is a different purpose for all of them. Sometimes I like to just imagine, okay, take me inside so that, that I can start to look upon this world in a new way, without having a preconceived idea based on the past of what is happening and what it's all for. I mean, right now we could call this scenario a retreat in rural Spain, but you, that's just a phrase we could give to it. But it's obviously more than that, <laughs> and we have to be shown that it's more than that. Without being shown that it's more than that, then we just stay with that. And then we stay with the personal identification. So, here we go. So what are we learning here? We're learning a lot. We're learning that, that he keeps being sent into scenarios. We could say from, let's just say from a reincarnation, from a Buddhist perspective, that, that these so-called lifetimes aren't really lifetimes. They're just scenarios. They're just images, they're just dream scenarios, and we seem to have a belief system with preferences, and we believe that we go into them. And that's why we call them lifetimes, but they're just simulations. It's just a series of simulations. We keep being inserted back into simulations, and why do we stay stuck in the simulations, but we have goals? We have, we have, in his case, he's been given like a military goal, or a goal of going in there, find the bomb, find the bomber, and prevent uh, the train from blowing up, to save lives. And he's trained in the military, just like a doctor's trained to save lives, a nurse is trained to save lives. Every profession that we have has, an architect is supposed to design things, construction workers are supposed to build things. People who sew are supposed to like, sew clothes, and you see we have all these artificial self-concepts and artificial purposes that are based on a belief in separation. Remember, God didn't create any of the scenarios, God didn't create the simulation, God doesn't even know of this simulation, so we're trying to, to work with Jesus now to escape the simulation. And the thing about it is, at first he had no clue what was going on with that eight minutes in that train. He was very disoriented. Then he goes and he sees this other guy in the mirror and he's like, now what is happening? Who am I? What is going on? But Goodwin is starting to help him fill in and he has a mission. But even his military mission to save lives and find the bomb and find the bomber is, is an outcome. He's looking for an outcome, and he's trying to look around at all the potential ones, and he looked and saw this guy come out of uh, the restroom in the back there, in the back of the train where the bomb was, and he sees that he, he looked afraid. He looked disheveled and, and afraid, so he's like, almost like a detective, like thinking, this guy's got to be my number one suspect. So he literally makes up this thing, to Christina, we got to get off the train. She's like looking at him like, Sean, what are you trying to do? Then he kisses her as a pretense to get off the, off the train so that he can see, because he has already been told there's two trains that are side by side when the bomb goes off. 
and somebody detonates it from outside, must be watching the trains when, when the trains come side by side. So as you see, he's trying to use his mind, his military training to do his job. Find the bomber, you know, find the, the bomb, the bomber, and then try to prevent the explosion. That's what happens with our dream scenario. We, we do have outcomes in mind. We, we, we go to places, we meet people, we do things, and we have, we have specific outcomes of what we want. We go to work because we want a paycheck. If we went to work and worked, let's say, two or three weeks the first time at a company, and they said, ah, we're not going to pay you. Most people would say, well, okay. I'm not going to work. <laughs> you're not going to pay me, I'm not going to work. There's an outcome, you know. It's like, I go to work, I go to the job, but I expect there'll be a paycheck. And if there's not, uh, things are going to shift. I'll go work somewhere else, where they do give me a paycheck. In relationships, there's lots of expectations. You know, I'll do this for you, but I do expect this from you, and so forth. We have expectations with the government. If we rent or, or own a home, there's expectations around with uh, utility companies and landlords. There's, it's, a, it's a whole, it's a whole, like a giant scheme of many, many outcomes that are sought for, outcomes that are tried to avoid, avoid those outcomes, and when we look at a scenario, we're not in the state of mind, but it starts off with lesson one from A Course in Miracles, nothing I see means anything. He was closer to that at the very beginning, when he first opened his eyes on that train scenario. He was just, so look at his face, he was like, like looking around like, what is this? Nothing I see means anything, like he had no clue what was going on. And Jesus is saying that's what he wants us to come toward, to be clueless, to, to not have predefined meanings and outcomes for everything. Because as long as we have these predefined meanings and these predefined outcomes, look what he did to this this guy who was motion, had motion sickness, you know, he goes on. <laughs> I mean, he just, she's like, she's like, Christina's like, oh, we're now into racial profiling. When we need to look at it, this dark skinned man and starts to be talking about him suspiciously. So, oh, we're into racial pro profiling now. And then he gets off the train under the guise, he kisses her and says he was going for coffee. She's like, are we going to go for that coffee now? Not now. You know, he's got an outcome in mind. So, this is what Jesus is teaching us with this movie, is when we have an outcome for the, the dream scenario and the simulation, when we have a form outcome in mind, we cannot really see what the whole dream simulation is for when we have a specific outcome in mind. Because all specific outcomes are ego outcomes. And there is an outcome that's not really an outcome, it's an coming inside, and that's forgiveness. See the false is false. See the world. See the simulation of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is going for. To see the unreality of the simulation. Even with Elon Musk and all the scientists, okay, it seems to be a simulation, but, but they don't go the next step. That the simulation is illusion, it's maya, and it's a trick. They're looking for what caused the simulation. But the scientists don't know that it's the ego. They don't even know what an ego is. <laughs> but they're more for trying to get outcomes and solve problems, like we heard from Socrates. But here, we do know that there's a point for all of this, and we do see now, whenever he goes in with that specific outcome in mind, he is, you know, knocking people over, and he is attacking people, he is doing all kinds of things because he has a specific goal under the guise of saving lives. He's getting a, a quite aggressive at times. And and Christina's going, What is wrong with you? Are you insane? Like she just sees Sean. <laughs> Somebody that's mild mannered Sean, the teacher. <laughs> he's gone berserk now. He's he's like going after people and doing things that she doesn't understand either. So here we go. That's that's our next phase of starting to see. He's got issues now because he's trying to fulfill a specific purpose with a specific outcome. Yeah. 
So it's beautiful. Even with that scenario, he was told what to do, go get the gun, he wasn't successful, he got locked up <laughs> and was bleeding on. But then she comes and he says, you know, what would you do if you just had a minute left to live? He's getting philosophical now. Yeah. <laughs> he's, even with his assignment, he's like there with her on the floor, saying, what would you do if you had only a minute to live? And he said, I would call my dad. Oh. <laughs> this is what happens when people are on their deathbed scenes, you know, what's, what's most important? Covered over by all the crazy minutia. Mm -hmm. What would you do if you had a minute left to live? I would call my dad. He's, he has a love for his dad. He's been away, in his mind, fighting missions in Afghanistan, sortie helicopter missions, and he misses his dad. Uh, from the United States, and and apparently he wishes to call his dad. Maybe there's some, some words he never got to speak to his dad. It's beautiful that no matter what the scenarios are, no matter what the seeming outcomes we pursued, it there comes a point where we start to ask questions of ourselves, and we start to go much deeper inside and say, if I just had a minute left to live, what would I do with that minute? It really tells us something about what's important to us. If I had a minute left to live. So this is beautiful too, that's another aspect of this movie. And, and as she's leaning over there with him, then here comes the explosion. But it's almost got a poetic beauty to it, because he's, he's, he said, I, I would call my dad. We, we now know that he wants to t say something, probably call his dad and, and tell him he loves him or something. He, he, it's one of his deepest regrets, and now we've gotten to that already in this. So the whole scenario has brought us to that. And now he's back in what seems to be some kind of chamber that lost power, that had some kind of liquid dripping out of it, and that he it started to drop in temperature. And so the two scenarios he's dealing with is the train scenario, eight minutes at a time, and this other kind of chamber uh, where he he was very threatened. In both cases, you know, he's he's believing he's a personality self and he's feeling very threatened and survival is important, but he also wants to save the lives of others. Uh, even though he's been told source code, he's not really going to be able to save anyone's life. They're basically telling him, no, this is, this is a, a scenario, you didn't save Christina, you're not going to save anybody on that train, but if you do find the bomber, then perhaps it can save lives on a broader scale. So that's the, still the military assignment. Okay, it's, we're going down the rabbit hole with this one, though. This, one, this one's going a long way. Again, we're just coming into second base here, but we've got, we've got to go to third base and come home with this one, because it's, it's got huge implications for our mind training. Okay, now it gets a lot deeper, because he's been so identified with Captain Coulter Stevens, and now he's getting information pretty strongly confirmed that Coulter Stevens is dead. So, now we're getting into consciousness, because clearly he's believed he was this character. She sees him as Sean, Sean Fentress. He was operating all along as if he's Captain Colter Stevens and identified with that personality and he's just getting evidence now for the first time that that is not the case, that he's been dead for two months. You can just imagine if you were going through this scenario and you found out that the person that you think you are is confirmed dead for two months and then you're like, who? Then who am I now? <laughs> what, what is going on here? And this is another great movie for bringing us back. Okay, now you can see it in his eyes. He's like, what now? Like, what really is going on? He's got these outcomes, this mission, this assignment, and yet this, he started looking into those numbers, trying to call uh, Dr. Rutt Rutledge at, at the place where the patch, where he saw where they're located, this uh, experiment, the people that are running this uh, source code thing, and, and he 
that you can see his, his world as he's known it is starting to really unravel. Because now it's a break from that identification with the character. Mm -hmm. If I'm not that character, then who am I? That would at least open the question. Mm -hmm. And that's what this movie is showing us, that we have to at least open the question. If I'm not the person I'm sure I have been, then what am I? Who am I? Okay, here it goes. It's get, we're grounding second now. It's going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. That's huge. You're imagining this. <laughs> Immediately, the power of wanting, the power of wanting, the power of the mind, as soon as he even is given a suggestion, am I imagining this? And it's like, yeah, this, you're imagining this uh, situation, and all of a sudden, the, that's a symbol of how powerful the mind is. The capsule that he imagines himself to be in starts expanding. Just at the suggestion of the power of the mind, that, that shows you how these expansions can happen, just at the suggestion, like, I'm imagining all of this. This image, the stream of images that I'm perceiving is not being done to me. My consciousness is imagining this. I'm imagining the person I seem to be, I'm imagining all the persons as they seem to be, I'm imagining the environment that I seem to be in. I mean, some people who go through like psychedelic drugs, ayahuasca and different things, they do go through like a lot of experiences that are way beyond their everyday perception, that kind of show the power of the mind. That's what the value is, is they show how powerful the mind is, and the, the mind is just making all of it up, and reading meaning into it, and, and making the whole motion picture that seems extremely real. And it's dependent upon believing that you are that character. So look at him, he's just laid out in this expanded capsule now. He's just taking in this one realization that that his personality self, Captain Colter Stevens, is, is dead, dead for two months, that they're saying part of your brain is active and that you're imagining, you know, this environment that you seem to be in. And if you carry that further, you know, it's beyond just the capsule, it's, it's imagining the whole world. So you can see from what he's trying to tell him, he said, no, you may have made that call, but it would have reached a different me, and a different reality. That's the military, and that's what the ego belief is, is that you can make a reality apart from God. And even with what we call the multiverse, which was explored a little bit in the movie, everything, everywhere, all at once. The multiverse is that there are separate realities going on simultaneously. But we're learning from Jesus that the projection of the cosmos is not reality. And there are no separate realities, because reality is not form. And even this idea of different scenarios going on simultaneously is a construct. But this guy's saying, no, you, you can't save anybody on that train. You didn't save Christina. You made a call, but that would, call would have reached a different me. And basically, he's just saying, you know, you're a ticking clock. You're, all he's seeing it is in terms of his mission of saving lives. And, and nothing else. He's, he, it's like very much like Newtonian uh, science, which says everything's separate. So let's start to investigate the separation. Let's study the separation. <laughs> let's infer and deduce information from the separation. That's what Newtonian physics, that's what the scientific method is, is trying to deduce information from the five senses and the evidence of the world and come to some kind of conclusion on the nature of reality. And Jesus is saying, no, Kant had it right, it's a priori, it's prior to your five senses. Nothing that your five senses show you has anything to do with reality, and never will. But, the key thing is, if you identify with yourself as inside <coughs> this, the matrix, inside these simulations, then you don't know who you are. You, you're, 
You're choosing to be identified with littleness. You're choosing to be identified with a personality instead of the vastness that you are. And the first step is to start to come into consciousness, and that's what's happening in this movie. You know, now the character that he probably was, Colonel Stevens, you know, he's, he basically sees that he's not that. And now he's got the questions and they are not answering his questions. They're more like, focus on the mission. Focus on the outcome. We want an answer of we, where the bomb is, which they already know now, and who the bomber is. So, you see, the ego will always attempt to focus on specific outcomes to prevent the mind from going back and, and seeing the big picture, from seeing the world differently. And that's the goal of the Course, and the goal of all deep spirituality is to see the world differently, from a different vantage point, and to see the entirety of it, to see the vastness of the, of the true identity. So, the goal, the military goal, was to find the bomber, to prevent the big dirty bomb from going off in Chicago and killing millions of people. And in that sense, he's gone in and gone in. It wasn't until he heard his father's voice, he was resisting even going back into the simulation, until he heard his father's voice about him being like a hero, and then he went back in. So, Jesus is showing us here that that as much as we may believe salvation, saving, is about saving people, saving situations, preventing things from happening in a script that's already pre-arranged and pre-written. Jesus is teaching us in the Course, he's say, saying, salvation is of the mind, and it's only attained through peace. He's telling us what needs to be salvaged, and it's our mind. It's our sleeping mind that believes in the ego that needs saved. It's not about saving people. A lot of times people go around, are you saved, you know, <laughs> in terms of Christianity? Do you know Jesus and everything? Yeah, it would be so easy if it's, yes I am, I'm saved, you know. It's like, Jesus is like, no, no, it's not the people. The dream characters that are projected that need saving, it's the mind that believes in the ego, that's asleep and dreaming in an insane world, that needs salvation. So he tells us the what. Only the mind needs salvation, and it's only attained through peace. He tells us the what and the means. He's giving us the whole thing. He's giving us the keys to remembering ourselves as Christ. The what is the mind needs to be salvaged, and it's through peace. You can see here, Sean, he now knows he's something in consciousness. He, he's not character, he's not Sean, and he's not the Captain Colder. He's not either of those. He's seen this scenario over and over, and he's been told that it's just source code, you can't affect it, you can't change anything, you can't save anybody. But now, he's found the bomber, but uh, he's, he did what was asked of him, find the bomber, to prevent the, the bombing of, of Chicago. But you can see at this point still, that's not the lesson. Jesus wants us to, to become a lucid dreamer. Jesus wants us to just see that we're dreaming the world. You know, it's no small thing to see that you're the dreamer of the dream. But he says, as soon as you can see you're dreaming the world, you can give it a new purpose. It was made in hatred, but you can give it a purpose of forgiveness. You can, you can actually see the illusion for what it is, and be happy. No matter what's happening, because why? Because you're not going to be chasing outcomes inside the matrix. And that's what all of our things, save the whales, save the planet, save the, oh, the atmosphere, the ozone layer, uh, save the cows, turn it to be a vegetarian, save, <laughs> save the cows, save the chicken, you know. Or it may be a, a country, I mean, we look at what's going on with uh, Russia and Ukraine, save, save Ukraine, save Gaza, save something. You see, the ego doesn't care what you fall for, it just wants you to try 
to say something inside the matrix so that you don't see that it is the problem. That the split mind, that the belief system that made up the world is in the mind, and the mind needs saving. That's why Jesus says, when I awoke, you were with me. That's an interesting phrase from the Course. When I awoke, you were with me. He's saying, we're the same one. You just have to be convinced and remember that it's not the world or anything inside the matrix that needs saving. Oh, I need to save this marriage. Oh, I need to save my relationship. Oh, my father's on life support in such and such a hospital. I need to do something to save his life. You know, we have great movies in the movie watchers' Guide to Enlightenment, The Fountain, where the character's so bent on trying to save his partner, his wife, that he keeps missing what she's telling him, you know, finish it. She's telling him, go into your mind and realize the truth of who you are, finish it. And he's thinking he needs to find the drug, the wonder drug, that will save her body. It's not the body that needs to be saved, it's not scenarios, it's not specific things in the world. And here he is, and he's looking across at Christina, and she seems to be dying, he seems to be dying, and he's seeing a scene where this, this guy is, uh, is off now in the, in the van with the bomb. And again, Jesus is just saying, well, it's just another scenario. You don't have to save Chicago. <laughs> Even in this scenario, you don't, it's not Chicago that needs saving. You see how tempting it is. If all the bodies were real, then that's a pretty good two million people save, save the people. But he's saying, no, save your mind. Save your mind by forgiving the world. So here we go. This is deep stuff, but now He's got to take some more steps, because he's seeing right now that this is, you know, what he thought he was going to try to do. He, he tried again in the scenario and it didn't, didn't work out. Wow. Power of the mind. So let all things be exactly as they are and not try to think you need to change anything. Isn't that relaxing? <laughs> That's all we're here to do, is to let all things be exactly as they are. To not judge anything. That's what Jesus said, judge not. So, this movie is so good for that. Because of all the energy that gets put into trying to change everything. Oh, Thank God. you. As <laughs> happily they go out there on their way, yeah. Yeah, it gives a whole new context to salvation in the mind. And the way we stay at peace is by not trying to judge the world, not trying to develop outcomes that we pursue, because all the outcomes that we try to make happen in the world are just self-concept goals. More of this, more of that, less of this, less of that. Things would be better if they were different. And Jesus is like, no. She says at the end, well, what are we going to do today? He said, why don't we just stay right here? <laughs> stay right here in this moment, you know, that's the, the joy. But you can feel the lightness, like it takes the the pressure off onto trying to solve something about the personality self, or solve something about the world. Change something about the world, you know, just to be a witness self and watch the world and behold the world and offer a blessing always to the world. That's what Jesus was just doing. He was just in that state of seeing the perfection of everything and it was all mine. And he was just offering the, the love of God to everything and everyone. And then letting the Holy Spirit, you know, if there's words to be spoken, they'll be spoken. If there's just a smile and a pat on the back, that's a smile and a pat on the back. It's, it's so different from this idea that we have to diagnose problems in the world. All of our institutions are about diagnosing problems and then trying to fix things. As if there's something wrong with the world. And Jesus is just saying, no, there's something wrong with your perception. 
of the world. You're seeing a fragmented world, and it's the perception that is distorted, not what you seem to perceive. It's just, uh, it's like that part in the Course, in the text, I am responsible for what I see, I choose the feelings that I experience, and I decide upon the goal I will achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. It's just, the, it's, the, it's all happening in the mind. And when we don't try to change the world, when we don't have ego goals for the world, this person needs to act a certain way, this person needs to change, this person needs to be different, you know. We start to realize, oh my God, it's just a misperception. Okay? Nothing has gone wrong ever in the world. And there aren't better and worse outcomes. It's just all equally as it is without any need to fix it or change it. So, there's no personal I that, that needs things to be different. I need more money, I need less money, I need more intelligence, I need less intelligence. I need more freedom and mobility of the body, I need less freedom and mobility of the body. You know, everything that we simply want to be different than it is in form is the ego's plan to distract us from be still and know. So it's just so profound, so deep. But that movie, you know, you could vicariously go with the character and see, okay, oh, it's not what he thinks, he's not Sean. Oh, he's not <laughs> Captain Colder. Oh, <laughs> he's dead. Oh. Oh, he's not <laughs> dead, alive, we don't have to think like that anymore. It seems like it, it uh, converted back to the call came through and before uh, anything could even develop with the train that morning, it was all already uh, done, wrapped up with the cell phone, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. And then even though that whole perception of a crisis was eliminated, you could see the Dr. Rutledge character was like, one of these days a crisis will <laughs> come along. <Yeah. laughs> the ego is still hoping for a crisis, so it can use something to gain fame and notoriety as a person. You see, you could see the motive that Dr. Rutledge there at the end, and you could see, you know, he and and Christina were just there, and it was this beautiful, <laughs> shiny reflection in downtown Chicago, and on a bright, sunny day, you know, everything fresh and clean and new, so. Well, that's it. Thank you. Source code, Thank you. we've tapped into the source with that one. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're off the hook, we don't have to try to change the world. We don't have to try to save, save things. Every situation is playing out perfectly from the Holy Spirit's perspective. All we need to do is join in that perspective and, and stay aligned with that perspective. And when somebody asks you, how are you doing, you could say, no cares, no worries. <laughs> Good on you, mate. <laughs> Speak from the truth. <laughs> It's like that. Good on you, mate. Good. It's all good. It's all good. There's people that do use that a lot. How's it going? All good. All good. Yeah. But I mean, from your heart to really feel it and mean it. It's all good. That's that's humble. Yeah. It's truly humble. It's like <clears throat> our title of our weekend was "Do Not See Air." So that's a big key right there. Seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. What a life, what a state of mind, right? When you're not insisting that something needs to change in form. Imagine how peaceful, mm. without any insistence that something be different in form.
to somebody who says, don't you care anymore? <laughs> you become so detached from the world that you have no care for the world. I do. I, I care enough to forgive it. <laughs> I care so much that I'm going to forgive it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to forgive the world. I care so much I'm going to do what Jesus is asking me to do. Forgive the world. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen that film many, more than once. And then, and even when you started introducing without saying, I knew it was that film you were going to show. And I felt some resistance come up. But, and I'm so happy for your commentary on this because I think the other times I never, I never totally got it. I think I, I tried to kind of understand what was going on, and I never did. I just feel so freeing to feel from this, from this angle. Just have to change the world. Yeah. It's perfect. It's like a, just a perfect thing that dropped in for us. I think it was a couple, two or three days, maybe a couple days ago, where I, I started to hear in my mind source code, source code, source code. So, I put it in my notes along with lots of others, the ones we watched last night and some others, and it's still like another night. <laughs> <laughs> We were looking at one, I, the one that uh, Murphy was giving, but then Jenny said, I've shown that movie <laughs> so many times, <laughs> and even recently, so, so that was the one, chances are, because it's, it's interesting to re-perceive relationships from this perspective, it's not wanting to change, fix, change, anything in the relationship, but just really coming to that place of allowance and acceptance. Yeah, that's a big one, because the, the temptation is, to, oh, if this would just change, or it could be better, it could, it could be much better if, you know, and the ego is always trying to change the world, save interpersonal relationships, save, save Mother Earth, you know, Save the planet, save the country. This is a year, 2024, there's a lot of seemingly major elections happening all over the world. We've got one coming up in the United States and everything, but then from the perspective of this film, you know, salvation is for your mind and it's, it's salvaged through peace. This is what needs to be saved, and here's how it's saved. It's just boom, boom, one, two. You know, you can use that one sentence from Jesus with anything. Only your mind needs to be saved, and it's only saved through peace. It's one sentence in the book that it says so much. It's the what and the how, in a very direct way, in one sentence, you know. And I remember the first time I read it, oh my God. <laughs> what sense from Jesus is so strong, but then the practical application of that, it's one thing to just say, oh, okay, I'm starting to grasp the metaphysics, but the transfer of training, you know, to, to take that one core thing mm -hmm. and then transfer, transfer, transfer to whatever is up, even like with this movie. Oh, I've seen that movie before. Now oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> It's like amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> you know, it's such a famous song. It's got such powerful lyrics. Yeah, I once was lost, but now I'm found. You know, now, now, now. Yeah, come back to the now. Uh, David, I, uh, I uh, didn't get it completely, <laughs> so I was a bit uh, confused because you say it's not about form, 
but he wanted to save the world. So that was why he wanted to get in and save the train. And then she took him, uh, she ended his life uh, by pushing a button, then it stopped. And then all of a sudden he was alive in the thing. So I missed something there. It, it froze and then it continued. Yeah. Yeah. To me, I took that part as, as like, well, when your mind shifts and you see it differently, then it still seems to be a moving script. It still seems to be images, but your mind has stopped judging them, and then the spirit can come through. So the spirit has to come through us in ways, when we're right-minded, it will still use the symbols of the world. To me, when I saw at the end, he, he kept saying, put me back, I, I want to save her. He still was not believing that, that the train had exploded and all the people were killed and that he could do nothing. Uh, he just had to just give up and accept that. He still had that impulse to save. But I think he was more like, he felt like, he had wanted to go through certain steps. And Jesus does say everyone has their part to play in salvation. So well, the characters, when they're given over to the Holy Spirit, play out their part in whatever way that is, whatever form that is. But it's just a, it was more for him a sense of completion, of um, kind of taking it back, 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 and even that scenario where he was, he and Christina were laying, dying in the parking lot. He was like thinking, that wasn't so joyful. Mm -hmm. It's got to be <laughs> a more symbolic, happy experience. And then when he got in there, you see how swiftly he moved, he went back and it almost he got in to get the gun and, and the handcuffs and just pop, 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 pop. And was so lighthearted and then pop, emptied out his wallet of all the hundred and like twenty-six dollars to to pay a comedian saying, I bet you can't I bet you you can't make them all laugh. And of course the comedian wants to make all the people laugh. And say, okay, some guy just gave me some money and then all the smiling faces, you know, it, it all is a freeze frame. You can see all the laughing faces, which is kind of like a snapshot of, of a happy, a happy photo where everybody's beaming. We've been putting some of the photos from our trip trips this past week up on Facebook, and people were making comments like, "Oh my God, everybody's just beaming and glowing," but that's just symbolic. And then I think to the idea that she seemed to, on the timeline, she uh, followed what she had said. They said, we'll end your life after the source. He said, just do it one more time and then end my life. And she followed through to keep her word, even though her boss was not intending to keep the word. And he had grand ideas for telling him one thing and using his consciousness, you know, for source code and everything. But she kept her word, and then it kind of shifted back to a different part of the timeline where basically it was, it was all uh, handled. Um, so it was just, there was no explosion. And, and in one sense, it's kind of how it works. Like when, when your mind is healed, then you do start to see lots of Reflections. I mean, I had, I was doing the course many years ago, and I was actually going to uh, take uh, my grandmother some, like, some lunch. And I used to always go to the same grocery store to go to the salad bar to make her a salad. She was probably in her 80s, maybe 90s, early 90s, and and I remember one day I was going to go bring her salad and this, I was doing my course workbook lesson and the lesson I was working on was it was there is no death the Son of God is free. That was my workbook lesson. So I went and I got the salad. I was going to go get the salad at the same grocery store that I always go to but the Spirit said no. Because after I did my lesson it said no go to another one. So I said, 
Okay, so I went to another one. I walked in, started to walk through the grocery store to walk to the back, and there my lesson was there is no death, the sun and God is free. And some woman had had apparently died in the grocery store that morning because I was walking through the aisles and there was a woman <laughs> laid out on the grocery store floor. And I remember looking and I kind of looked around because she was just laying there by herself and I looked very closely at her, like her diaphragm and her to see if she was moving at all and she wasn't. It was just like a, a corpse in the grocery store because I'm going to get my grandmother but my lesson of the day was there is no death, it's not a good tree. So I kind of saw that and I walked over to, still working my back, way back to where the salad bar was, to, to the frozen foods area. So I was standing with my hand on the frozen foods area, looking at this corpse. And then all of a sudden, this Jesus started off in my mind, there is no death. Son of God is free. There is no death. It was like a roller deck. There is no death. The Son of God is free. And so I to feel all this energy going here and all this energy going here. And watching, there is no death. The Son of God is free. There is. And then she started breathing again. Oh, wow. I was just like, <laughs> just doing my lesson. <laughs> Getting some salad, salad bar from my grandmother, but to see how Jesus uses the lesson. And the things in the world are symbols, you know, obviously. He's saying, teaching us the body's not born, it doesn't really die, it's all symbolic, it's a dream, it's a dream symbols. But it was, it was like a, a raising the dead experience, you know. When you do this course, you don't really know what you're in for. <laughs> Nobody does, you know. But it, but it was so matter of fact. It was almost like it was almost like here I'll show you a little skit. This is part of your lesson for today. And I keep saying, I mean it. <laughs> this is not. I'm not playing around here. I mean it. When I when I write, this is the lesson of the day. Give your heart to it. Give everything. And so I remember I was like. I, then I watched, and then some people came, and some paramedics were there, and and yeah, she was breathing, and and she wasn't before, and but uh, so I just went back and got the salad bar and took it to my grandmother's, and yeah, it was it was like okay, you no, know, it was it was it was integrated into the workbook practice, you know, very well. So I think in this movie, you know. It's clearly he had this this belief that he was told, you know, it's just a simulation and it, the people are dead and you, you can't have no impact and no effect on anything. So I think that was like a symbol of him saying, send me back one more time. I want to save her. He, he wanted to save her and everyone else on the train. It's symbolic, you know. That desire to be helpful, the desire to complete your mission and to extend that <coughs> desire to, to help. He was just trying to be truly helpful. And then the situation played out where he did everything that he was planning to do, including call his father mm -hmm. and, and con convey. And the father was able to say, I, I said, I loved him so. So he was able to hear that from his father, and he, he said, uh, I just wish I, father said, I just wish I told my son, and he said, he, he knows. Yeah, that was like a completion too, of the father, some kind of communication that was missing. He completed that too, and then uh, it froze, which was a beautiful way, in the moment that she pushed the red button, it froze everything. But then it, it then carried on almost to teach us that that the world we perceive, nothing changes in in the world. The script ultimately it's still this is a flow of images, but you just are to see it differently. You're just to observe it, to see that it's a dream. We don't 
necessarily dream dreams at night and say, all right, Jesus, do a freeze frame on it and just freeze my nighttime dream in the middle of it, you know. He just wants us to dream softly of your sinless brother. Remember his kindnesses and the love he gave, instead of the hurts that he gave. See, see the dream with thoughts of love, with thoughts of blessing, thoughts of gratitude and nurturing. And I think that's what that was at the end where you know, she was waiting for him to ask her out for a cup of coffee, and then he just said, yeah, I don't have to, just to let you know, I don't have any money. He gave all his money away <laughs> to the comedian, and he was just there in the moment saying, what a beautiful day it is, and just happy to be there in the moment. So I think that's, that's all it was showing at the end. The Course is is it really trying to tell us that we need to try to have a goal of changing the world? But it is telling us we have to see it differently, and that differently is without judgment. Just see it, see it without judgment. And you can practice that with any scene that you can imagine, you know. Any scene, you, we have lots of opportunities to practice just allowance and acceptance. Yeah. You could look at yourself, your character, and just go, hmm. I forgive, forgive her and forgive the script. She doesn't have any errors or issues or problems. She never did anything wrong. Living in the woods it was perfect. Seemingly not interacting with it. That was just perfect. Jesus is like, Absolutely perfect. <laughs> that was a great job. You did a beautiful job. You know, Jesus is like perfect. Perfect. When I worked at hospice as a volunteer, you know, I would, I would go there and, and the whole place was filled with people who were like taking their last days and weeks on earth. So I was a hospice volunteer, but I would go in, I would get called in. To, I'm carrying plates of food, trays of food around. I heard people in hospice rooms calling me in, and I would go in, and I would go there, and I would just sit down and just let the spirit come through me. What a great life you've lived, and just absolutely perfect. And you should be so grateful. What a fine job you did. And I would just tell them how wonderful their life was, and how it was mission accomplished, and mission complete, and everything, and then the next day I would come there, they'd checked out. they <laughs> let go, holding on to the body. they had heard what they needed to hear. Great job, job well done. There was, I was like saying, great, innocence, there's no guilt, you know. Because some of them were like hanging on, oh, I don't want to let, let down my my children, or my grandchildren, or, you know, there's still this guilt belief, like, I can't let go because I'm going to hurt somebody, or let somebody down. I say, no, not nonsense. We, we did a great job. And then they would feel the innocence, and then it was easy for them to let go of the body. So, they always talk about physicians trying to save lives, or this guy in here was trying to save millions of lives. I, I was clear out of ward. I was there for two days. There was a bunch of exits. <laughs> How many lives did you save this week? <laughs> I think I lost about 15. <laughs> but see, you don't have to think like that anymore, because life is not of the body. Life is of the mind. You know, we're not here to save lives. We're, we're here to be happy. <laughs> we actually are only here to watch the simulation and learn the lesson of happiness, of joy. And then once we get into extreme joy, then, then Jesus is like, okay, that's enough then. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> no more need. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a perspective. It's just starting to see ourselves without Judgment. Let's, let's listen to that song, Let All Things Be Exactly As They Are. Let not our sight be blasphemous today, meaning let not our eyes be used for 
perceiving differences, mm -hmm. nor let our ears attend to lying tongues. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not hear any differences or perceive any differences, perceive any differences. You know, only reality is free of pain, only reality is free of loss. Only reality is wholly true, and it is only this we seek today. That's what was from Jesus was singing in the song, like, yeah, that's it. So it's really me, I perceive, and if we want to try cushions tomorrow, maybe there is the sound. First cushions. Okay, you want that inside. Just handle the during the movie. <laughs> right, during the movie, before. <laughs> there is a timeline. <laughs> The cushions are in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me on, uh, well, when we had a talk with, when I had a talk with the, uh, Ginny Barrett, and I was a little bit sad, and I just had a phone call with my brother, and I felt like, I was not loyal to the, my family. We have a business, and so my brother just told me on the phone, uh, you have to be a responsible as shareholder and that kind of thing. So I shared, I don't feel loyal, so loyal to the family as I should. And then Jenny said, you only have to be loyal for your own mind. And that, <laughs> that was a, a big relief. I, yeah, still a kind of, yeah, reminder, reference point. The movie reminded me of that, that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because in your heart, you do love and value integrity. And Jesus is saying, yeah, have that integrity in, in your mind. For everyone and everything. You know, be unified in your purpose. Be unified in remembering your spirit. But when we project it out into bodies, then the, there comes the guilt. Right. Integrity, you could have been more integrous, you should have, could have, would have, you know, should have, would have, could have done something different to be more loyal to the family. And, yeah, you're just trying to be loyal to peace of mind. Yeah. And loyalty to something born can lead to sadness. Because it's, it's, it's a judgment. Right. It's a judgment. Bob did something wrong. <laughs> Sad. Then you see the judgment and then you come back into the mind and it's like, Jesus right. is in charge of the plan and he wants me to see the world, you know, yeah. with him. See yeah. it in non-judgment. That's that's what to be Lord. Yeah, I think it was my own judgment. Maybe not even my brother so much. But I, I think I made it bigger in my mind. <clears throat> Years ago, I was traveling, traveling, doing course workshops and gatherings all over the place. I was doing so many, I was gone for weeks and weeks, months at a time. But then I did get the message from my mother and my sister. My father is, is in the hospital, and yeah, we would love to come back. As soon as you have an opportunity, and I continue on with my travels and gatherings, but kind of like the Jesus and Lazarus, you know, hurry quickly, Mary and Martha, Her, your friend Lazarus is dying, hurry, stop what you're doing. Jesus didn't, he continued preaching and doing what he did. Then by the time, he did say something to the apostles, like, this one is not to the death. But by the time they got there, days later, Lazarus was finally dead, but he was buried already in the grave. Everyone's like, what's he thinking? Jesus said it's not to the death. And Mary and Martha crying, Lord, Lord, if you just 
We know that he will be resurrected in the day of the resurrection. If he'd only been here a little bit sooner, our brother would not have died. And then Jesus goes over. He just tells Mary and Martha the truth. I am the resurrection. Like, don't be talking to me about the day of the resurrection like in the future. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. He says, and then he goes over to the stone, roll away the stone, Lazarus, come forth, you know, he is not, it's not a matter of time for him, you know, raising the dead, because he is the way, the truth, and life, that's the spirit. So, I think that's, with my death, I remember I continued traveling, and then when I got there, they said, oh, he's in intensive care, he's in a, he's unconscious, he's in a coma. And I said, okay, well, we'll take me to him. So I went in to intensive care, went into where he was in the coma, and he came right out of the coma. Dave! It was this ball. It's all perception. <laughs> and then he's like, he, he didn't want to talk to anything about his body or intensive care, and then he just said, Wow, where have you been traveling? Where have you been teaching? That's that's what came out of the coma. Talk to me about that, and then yeah, and then he yeah, he passed away. But I was off again traveling, so I wasn't there even for the funeral. And some of the people were saying, "Where, where is Dave?" I wasn't there for for his funeral, but uh, then. I had a trip planned to go back to Cincinnati uh, too long ago, some, some few years ago I think it was, and, and um, I was in the Guadalajara airport with, in the lounge getting ready to hop on a flight to Cincinnati, and then my sister called and said that my mother had had a heart attack or a stroke, and, and and was unconscious, and can you come to Cincinnati? As I'm in the airport already with a ticket to Cincinnati, she's saying, and in my head my phone sound turned off, but I had to look down and see her name, her general answer, can you come to Cincinnati? I'll be right there. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was literally in the lounge getting ready to go, and then I went there and I could see she was unconscious, but while I was there, it was just to be there with the family, and, and everything, everybody was going through around that, and and then I remember going to the hospital and yeah, going in there, we would go in two people at a time, and yeah, she would, everybody was laughing and talking to her and and happy and joyful and fully communicating in the room with her, even though she was laying there unconscious, and her eyelashes, her eyelids were moving a little bit. But, um, you know, I was aware, yeah, the communication is not limited by the body, so everybody was just sharing all their love and joy with her, and it doesn't matter whether her body seems to be unconscious or not, the communication is much farther beyond the body and the five senses. So that was beautiful too, and then when she passed away, I was there with the whole family, got to be there for that, and then even to the to the uh, cemetery. Yeah, got to go there and this big group of people there and be there with the whole. But it's more like we're just there to offer love, extend love, regardless of the scenes that are before us. You know, to just to be used as a as a demonstration of love at all. But I was just aware. Yeah, communication was uninterrupted. That the, the body didn't break communication. Because I've had people over the years that say, Oh, my mother died, I never got to tell my mother how much I loved her, or my father died, I never got to, he, he died before I could get back and say how much I love him. I say, tell him now. Now? <laughs> sure, tell you now. <laughs> He's been dead for you. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Communications of the mind, it's, it's uninterrupted, it's not, it's 
it's not of the, we associated it with the body and the five senses, but it's way beyond that. It's we're always communicating with ourselves, really. We're always we think it's other people, but it's really we're always just teaching our mind's teaching what it wants to learn. We're just communicating to ourself and learning to teach only love, you know, to to remember only the loving thoughts and to let go of the rest, all my grievances. So, so it's all for, it's all about waking up. It's you know, like, but communication gets used really strongly. So. It was beautiful that your brother called you. You know, gave you <laughs> another opportunity there. Yeah. 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 yeah that was really helpful. Yeah.